very warm welcome to this discussion of the University of Applied Arts, Arts in Vienna. My name is Stefan Hilpold, um, I'm the head of the Arts and Culture section of the Venice Daily Standard. And I'm very happy and very glad to uh, moderate this discussion for the next, let's say, one and a half hours. Before I introduce um, our uh, discussion partners here in the panel, let me, um, let me tell you a little story, explore some, some thoughts. It was like 20 years um, ago when um, a fashion show in 1999 uh, kind of uh, surprised, kind of shocked the fashion world. Alexander McQueen, I'm sure you, you all, all know him, um, he, he showed uh, a show and at the end um, Shalom Harlow, the, the supermodel at that time, came on the runway in a white dress and besides her there were two robot arms, two big machines and they were spraying color on her, on her dress. She was turning around uh, the, 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 the dress became from a white dress to a beautiful, colorful um, dress. So there were lots of questions which arose at that uh, time, which is, who is the object? Who is the subject? Uh, is this a piece of art? Who is the master of it? Now, 20 years later, we are here at the Giardini of the Biennale and I'm sure you all saw the, the piece of art, just a couple of rooms uh, next to uh, here. It's called um, Can't Help Myself by uh, two Chinese artists, Bang Jia and Sun Zhuan. It's a big robot arm, very similar to the one like 20 years ago. It's black this time, um, 20 years ago it was white. There's no human body uh, in, the, in, the, in, uh, in it but there is lots uh, of blood. Um, the, the arm is wiping the blood from one uh, corner to the other, from one side um, to the other. And again, we are, um, we are, we are, there are many questions which um, we, have to con we have to confront. Object, subject, where's the human, where's the human being, um, is this a self-fulfilling piece of, of, of art, and so on. And all these questions, I think, they will somehow uh, be the theme at this discussion uh, as, as well. Um, please let me introduce uh, the panel um, uh, we, have, we have here. Um, I would like to start uh, on the far right with Gerhard Bast. He's the president of the University of Applied Arts Vienna and member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Um, then we have Ruth Schnell. Um, she's a pioneer of media art based in Vienna, working with computer-aided tools since the mid-80s. Um, and since 2010, she has been the head of the Department of Digital Arts at the University of Applied Arts Vienna. Then we have Virgil Widerich. He's a screenwriter, a film director, multimedia artist, and also a professor of art and science uh, at the Vienna University of Applied Arts. His short copy shop was nominated for uh, an Oscar. Then I would warmly welcome uh, Margaret Yaman, she's an artist and professor for artistic research at the PhD in Arts program um, at the University of Applied Arts in, in Vienna and at the same time she's also a professor in Zurich at the EDH for game research. And uh, last but not least, Putemita Bauer, um, she is uh, founding, founding director of the NTU Center of Contemporary Art in Singapore, and she was formerly an associated professor uh, in the Department of Architecture at MIT, uh, Massachusetts. A very warm, warm welcome for all the participants in the discussion. As I said, 
we have like one and a half an hour for, for the discussion. I would like to begin on the podium, on the panel, maybe for like 70, 75 minutes, and the last 15 minutes, and the last 20 minutes. I would like to open the discussion to the public. So um, you're very well, uh, very well welcome to ask questions, um, but we go uh, to that after after uh, words. Um, you, I'm sure you ask yourself, what are the, the piece of pieces of art behind of me? Uh, let me just tell you one thing. Uh, they are made by students of the University of Applied Arts Vienna, by uh, the department Art and Sci uh, Science, headed by Virgil Wiedemann, who sits um, among us. Um, I would like to split the discussion into um, three parts. You know the theme is digital transformations, society and arts at the turning point. At the turning point. Um, it's, a quite, it's a wide range we are discussing today. So I would like to start with some general questions about the transformation we have to face in the next couple of years, in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 year, years on the uh, level of the society of politics. Afterwards, I would like to address questions, what does that mean to arts? What does that mean to culture? And third, what does that mean to universities? What does that mean to our educational uh, system? So, let me begin with uh, the woman right next to me, the Meta uh, Bauer. Um, you um, are based in Singapore, um, so you are um, kind of in the, in the, in the heart of technolo technological developments. Um, you um, are very much um, uh, uh, faced with uh, artificial intelligence, with robotics, with genetic engineering. Uh, what do you think? Are these, all these technological developments, are they kind of, um, are they kind of replacing uh, human muscle power, um, or not only human muscle power, but also thinking? Maybe because I'm in a chemical complex, as you mentioned, from MIT, and now being in a High tech city, in a high tech city, maybe I'm a technological skeptic. So um, I wouldn't say human um, muscle power, but I think it's um, we have a, an incredible body of multiple sensoriums, and I think uh, for artificial intelligence, robotics, etc., it's a long way to go. We're just at the very, very beginning, and what I'm um, is where I see the role of the arts is also to reflect those developments and being maybe a counterintelligence and a critical voice uh, in these developments and in order to even understand what could that mean, what does that mean and don't we trust maybe or have too much hopes in the technology because technology is only um, as smart um, as those who program their algorithms and the question is even this AI, this artificial intelligence, um, how far does it go? And we're talking about self-learning systems. And I just had a talk about becoming post-human and we showed Odyssey 2001. Uh, this is how uh, the famous computer who, who tried to exclude the two astronauts and then keep them outside and one dies. And I don't know if we got so much further since that. And so I think it's really, Interesting to me, I'm not like against technological development and uh, I mean, the digital is there, we all work with it, we all have smartphones, we all have computers. Uh, I think the technology can help us with a lot of things, so I'm not against that, but I think we really have to understand the potential and uh, what's not possible and the challenges that come along with it. And I really also trust again artists with their sensorium to be really also very alert to those developments and really also see the downsides of it and, and the positive sides of it. But I think we are still very much at the beginning. But are we kind of, if I understand you the right way, are we kind of exaggerating, uh, looking into the future? Are we, uh, is it 
to make us a fuss uh, uh, talking about this, you know, digital revolution changing everything. I don't know if you had drug species communication. So I also think how humans interact with machines, also how animals or other life forms interact with machines is very, very interesting. I mean, you have here Thomas Arasino's installation, I think some of you might have seen um, his work with Arach Marines. He also works with material scientists on uh, silk properties and they, they work on uh, synthetic silk properties uh, from, from spider silk, uh, which is a very strong material. So this is, these are very interesting experiments and it's, to me again it was very interesting that it got started by an artist and he works now since several years at MIT with the material science department, but he also works with the Senckenberg Institute and uh, also in Berlin with the Institute of Interspecies Communication. So I think there, there is, of course, a much wider range now of interactions, but I would not say here's the machines and here's the humans, but what kind of interaction can we help have and like where can we come also to a different understanding of this world in this combination? So I think to me, it has to be transdisciplinary and has to be also across, um, across, across the fields and um, and then we have to see where, where does AI come in, where does robotics come in, and um, how can we have this interplay? I mean, in, med in medicinal um, research, so it's so crucial that we have um, the support of machines and we look into nano and macro uh, processes. And I think it's very important that we look and be open to look into that, but also to critically reflect it. You, uh, Gerald, Gerald Bast, we are we are uh, facing so many negative perspec uh, perspective uh, looking at the future. Um, so scientists tell us that like 40 or 50, 50 percent of all workplaces will vanish in the next uh, 20 years. What do you think? What does that mean for society? What does that mean politically? Uh, what are we facing in the next 20 years concerning this special topic? Well, you. You mentioned uh, the studies uh, telling us that uh, 47, 50 uh, percent of the now existing jobs uh, uh, will not, not anymore exist in 20 years. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, studies uh, financed by diverse uh, lobbying groups uh, telling us no, no, don't worry, it won't uh, be 50%, it won't be 40%, it may be, will be uh, 30 or 25% and uh, there will be a lot of new jobs uh, created by uh, the digital revolution in the next uh, decades. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, uh, everybody is, uh, is knowing and admitting that uh, digital revolution, the technological revolution, will uh, cost uh, a lot of uh, existing jobs. Uh, that's no doubt. The only question is if and how many new jobs will arise and when will this happen? This is the big question. And, uh, uh, so far, almost none of these counter studies uh, telling us, don't worry, uh, we will manage the, the, the problem. Uh, they don't tell us uh, when and which kind of new jobs will arise. So, uh, if we, and uh, may it be not uh, 30, uh, even if we have 25 or 20 percent uh, jobs uh, disappearing in the next uh, 15, 20 years, you have to imagine this is total revolution in society. The first industrial revolution uh, lasted 100 years. 100 years the society had time to change. We don't have 100 years. We not even have 50 years. I think it will be 15, maximum 20 years, uh, what will uh, last this uh, total trans uh, transition. And, uh, I think we, we have to start now, and we will talk about education later on, uh, we have to talk now and to act now, even if politics uh, who are looking for the simple, the very simple solutions and don't find them, they ignore the problem, 
uh, we have to look at uh, what uh, finding a new de definition of human labor or human work. Uh, and uh, this is the, the big question, uh, the big topic uh, for, for all parts of society, from uh, economy to politics uh, and not the least uh, education. What will be the new definition of labor uh, in uh, 20 years and who will have the power to define it? And in this kind, I think uh, education and the arts will play a big role in this uh, new definition of what is labor. But about what kind of jobs uh, uh, vanishing are we talking about? Uh, I'm sure it's not all of our jobs. It, there's not certain jobs. So which are the most endangered ones? Well, that's also interesting. It's not just uh, what a lot of people believe is not just uh, robots uh, uh, who uh, robots which which are uh, working in, in manufacturing uh, plants uh, who uh, who make uh, the manufacturing workers uh, obsolete. No, this already is going to happen. It's increasingly happening. Uh, uh, but what we will face is that uh, for the first time the well-educated or seemingly well-educated middle classes will be uh, very much uh, part of this uh, revolution. So law, uh, administration, public administration, uh, business administration, even medicine uh, and even parts uh, of uh, the arts of the creative, uh, so-called creative industries, which was hyped in the 1980s, 1990s, as the future, all these uh, areas will be uh, inflicted with robotics and even more with artificial intelligence. So this is uh, the totally new thing that not uh, uh, only the low-educated uh, classes uh, will be affected by this new the situation, but uh, the middle classes uh, and uh, parts of the so-called uh, well-educated upper classes will be affected. And uh, it's not just uh, that uh, education as such will bring a solution. The real question is which kind of education. Um, um, we are not only only confronted by a huge shift. Uh, on the work in the workspace, uh, we are well now confronted by a huge shift in gathering information, by a huge amount of knowledge. We are we are we are confronted uh, every 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 day. Um, how can we deal in future with this huge amount of of information? In which concern technolo technology can help us uh, uh, with it, or how important is it that the technology helps us? I think um, I'm, it's very important for, for, for future, yeah? but I think first we need, and I agree with Ute Meta Bauer, we need a clear awareness of the present and the massive technological changes we are witnessing at the moment. Knowledge is the key and the fundamental tool to critically respond to that scenario. What I want to say is code, algorithms and big data are something we have to watch critically now. Using our knowledge and our mind and our bodies, as we know vital decisions are being delegated to algorithms including, for example, decisions which lane, best traffic lane, but also about the opportunity to get a job or not to get it. Now, not in the future, it's now. And or to uh, to loan to get a loan from a bank and micro -targeting, targeting techniques uh, are set up in order to influence the decisions uh, of consumers or the ones of voters of elections. Yeah. So uh, and as if it's Harari who says we have to be in the game and to keep us or 
there are more the dystopian or the more the utopian. Margaret Mitchell is a, a Google scientist. Uh, she says we have to drive this car. It's not a self-driving car. We have to drive it, and we 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 can have it, or we could drive it, or we can at least participate. And we have to change. It, it, my 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 opinion is we have to change from. Uh, users to participants, yeah? but that's only possible because algorithms are quite hard to understand. So the effects are quite um, easy to understand, the effects, but not the consequences. And we have to know about the consequences. For instance, of course, that means we have, we have um, uh, for instance, there, there was last year, uh, Google uh, participated in a, a secret military project called Maven. Uh, it's an AI partnership with, on self-learning weapon systems with the American with the Pentagon. So um, their own employees didn't know it, and as they could find out it, so they they. The, uh, due to the massive protests of the of the employees there, some quit the job, some uh, so Google had to 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 end this cooperation by last December. So it's we are in the situation now. That it's very hard to get to 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 look into it. Of course, the algorithms are a, a self-learning system, but we have to get more information, transparency, uh, um, uh, reflection about the consequences. So you said like two very, very, very interesting sentences. Um, so we have to, to watch algorithms, among, uh, among others, uh, algorithms uh, very critically now. And at the same time you said uh, we have to change from user, users to proponents. So this leads me to my next question to Virgil, Virgil Widerich. How can we at the same time uh, 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 be, uh, you know, use algorithms and be critically uh, uh, towards it? How does that work? Or does it work? Well, most people don't know what an algorithm is. It's simply a specification of how to solve a class of problems. And this, of course, is neither good nor bad. We do it every day. We have rules in society. The Ten Commandments are an algorithm. And the cookbook is an algorithm how to make a pizza. So, um, but of course, mathematicians object when I say that. It's a bit more complex than that. But for the sake of simplification, let's call it like that. So when we make a pizza ourselves, we know what we are doing and we know the consequences. The problem starts when we don't know the algorithm we are cooking by because this is done by a machine and the machine probably is not only one entity, it's, com it's programmed by several companies, it has parts from all over the world inside and nobody really knows what this machine does. Does your iPhone listen to you? Um, it, I notice that it gets brighter when I look at it, so it watches my eyes um, and things like that. And of course we don't have any politicians who understand anything about that. That is a bit boring because the competence to deal with these issues on a political level, to drive the development and to also um, protect the people, doesn't exist anymore. And if we imagine how this has changed in Europe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when they tried to count the people and people had to fill in the religion, how many protests were there? But now give so many data away and nobody cares actually. In Europe we care a little bit, in America they don't care very much about that at all. So we don't know what's going to happen. And if I look at present politics, I wouldn't trust data in the hand of the government very much. So if you understand you in the right way, we have to uh, really force in a way our critical understanding of, of things like algorithms and other, other things. But how can we do so? Yeah, it's very complicated because you have to read a lot and be in the subject and I think most people don't do that and especially politicians don't, that there's not even a knowledge that we have to do it. But it's the same with economy, I mean who really understands economy and if you combine it with computers that also nobody really understands, it's a mess. <laughs> 
you, you, you did a, quite a lot of research on the uh, political and sociological uh, side of this new uh, de deve develop development. How can we as a, as a society deal with it uh, without, you know, break apart? Yeah, but the fractalizing is not uh, a bad idea, as you say. That breaking apart is not necessarily so negative, <laughs> if we translate it literally, to my uh, Austrian language thinking, because this means that many parts, and sometimes many, the, the, F, the, the impact and effects that the development of a digital transformation of the key technologies and leading technologies and sciences that we have at the moment that were mentioned already, as well, which are, to name it again, other developments in AI, in the deep dream, the deep learning networks, the big data issues mentioned, the data claiming issues, the biogenetic engineering and CRISPR technologies in combination with this uh, um, acquisition of data and recombination of uh, information societies that we have with the biopolitical societies that we have. So one strategy that we have, it was also already mentioned, the radical criticism that we need, but also let, let me answer with a uh, short um, story. This month I was at a, a summit and at the new museum New York and it was called Another AI in Art, Decolonizing Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Art Making. And the interesting thing was, it was um, who was there? It was a big number of people from different fields, like uh, also from Google, Deep, Deep Learning, what to name it, Bloomberg, Data, etc. And they all invited a number of artists who were partly experienced, partly technological, new artists, and they, we had to sit on a table the whole day and writing and associating about the future and what we think. And at a certain moment, I just wanted, I didn't want to write anymore on this table sheet with sitting the, the CEO of Bloomberg Data Acquisition next to me. And with the, of course, it's not to say that there are bad intentions, but resistance, this term again. And I said, they said, what are we missing in the AI development? And I said, resistance, not just the emotional intuition we are also missing, but my intuition said to me, we miss resistance right now. And that's also a strategy since longer that we are also agents of change as artists, where we can resist to certain movements not to refuse it like uh, cutting the wire, which is stupid because we need uh, literacy, then we come to the education part, but also in the term of a political agency to uh, participate, uh, resist against certain, really certain seductions, seductive moments where we would gain, so we expect so much. It's about the future, but from, of course, this very moment of agency. But, I mean, if we look to, to the United States or to America, if you look to, to Asian uh, countries, they are kind of raising new technologies. So, um, resistance, I mean, is this something we, we, can really, we can really, really do? I mean, that's a privilege maybe we don't have anymore. Yeah, there was also a Chinese professor there from a job, I'm sure I pronounced wrong, from the Chinese Academy of Arts, who is very well known in the field as artist and as educator also. He also was in the Los Angeles Climate Change Conference of the UCLA of the Nanosystems Technology Institute this, this month. And so, of course, he goes there and he says, because they have immediate um, new structures of participatory, participative um, processes and you gain some, so it's embraced of course, to facial recognition and because you have a direct credit in bonus system which if you are there it really helps you if you go to the authorities and if you have your scoring points. It is really scary for us on the first glance, second, what do people do then with it? So resistance needs a new definition. It can be futile. Resistance is futile, you know, but futility is resistance, I would say also. 
Thank you. Like absurd Dadaistic state that sense. It helps as a vehicle the playful inversion of processes and playing with the algorithm as well. Maybe let's at, at this point of the of the of the discussion let's maybe bring uh, arts and culture uh, um, into, into it. There are so many things machines, technology can do so much better we can do. But what are the things humans are better in? Humans uh, with their all their all their uh, thousand years of knowledge of of culture are better in. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, coming from the arts, it's obvious, the, the initial question was always like, what is good art? So I think what is better? I mean, that's very, very relative. What I think, I think I share this with my colleagues, it's like there is no way back. We are confronted with this situation. And the question is much more, um, what kind of um, methodology, what kind of thinking does the artist contribute? What, what is the radical difference of the methodology how artists approach the world. And that was for me also interesting when I was at MIT. We were teaching not art students, we were teaching all the students, marine biologists, our astro students, but um, in a different way of thinking. You know, that they are beyond the discipline and getting more uh, from a different angle into this. But what I think is what, what we are confronted now is um, Again, to come back to this post human thinking, and that doesn't mean AI replaces humans, is much more. We have to accept we are living in a multiple, in a multiple systems world, and, and the human is just one life form in all of those systems. And how do we deal with this, accepting this? And I think through AI, we finally understood there are much more systems like fun fungi, microbes, bacteria. I don't know if some of you are coming back to the arts. I've seen in the last uh, sculpture project, uh, the work of the week, uh, where we had a bacteria driven uh, machine. Basically, the bacteria would, uh, through their um, electric activity, steer the ceiling um, with the light coming into the space. So, he basically made visible how already different life forms actually have also a say in our world, while we still think we have to say. And um, so to me it's not just AI, it's really understanding the multiplicity of life forms and these interactions. And I really agree with my colleagues, like, um, we have to understand how this is all functioning. We cannot go back and I think it's really important to um, also train our students and so like to engage with this, to be, to be even able to to see what's happening. It's not even to be critical, sometimes they don't even see it, they're not aware. And um, at, at MIT we also have the Center for Civic Media and um, Kate Warford, I think, you know, her. she started um, the Institute for AI now, but that's a critical entity to really have a check and balance what's going on in AI. And we, we cannot go back and I think it's, it's very important that also artists with their way of thinking and maybe being in a different way embedded in the world, engage in this new development. But if you understand really right, why going forward means, in a way, going back. We're going back to, to nature, for instance, what, uh, the example you gave just, just before. I wouldn't say go back to nature. It was also this division between nature and artificial intelligence. And so this, these are very, um, I'd say, like um, abstract um, divisions. I think it functions much differently. We, all, we continuously already interact um, with, with machines. And it's, it, there is no way out, but we are also constantly embedded in nature. I mean, it's, it's not like there is the city and there's the country and there's nature. I mean, our body is full of bacteria. We are nature. But we are already partially machine. Each of us is a cell phone. We have body extensions. So we really have to understand that there are just divisions in that way how do you prefer it, don't exist in this way. And we have to really learn how to be understand ourselves differently in this complex system and how can we still uh, be able to even interfere. And I think my colleagues who work in that area, they might know much more about the possibilities that are there. Well, so then let's, let's ask them. Um, Maybe, I don't know, Vigil uh, Vigil Vigil, you are in the arts and science uh, field. Um, how can we gain new 
new uh, cultural te technologies. Um, how we, uh, are we doing that, or how do you do that with your students? Well, I think we, we have to accept uh, at the next level of humiliation that humans will have to endure, not being the center of the universe, not coming from God, but from the ape. And I'm very sure the day will come where a machine is better at everything. It's maybe 10 years, maybe it takes 50 years, but I'm sure it will be composed better, it will write better, etc. This will be a big shock and it will question our democracy if we still have it. Uh, maybe everything is already owned by a country that has no democracy. Um, and it will also bring a lot of questions. On the other hand, I think, let's imagine a computer finds a cure against Alzheimer. Would we be really angry? Yeah. So it's not only negative, it's possible that things happen that we didn't solve as humans until now. So how do we teach it? Um, there is no strict rule because this is all liquid, this is all multidimensional. Um, what we do is very simple, we connect our students from the, and the students themselves are not all from the art field, but from some from art, some from science, some from both, and they are from all over the world, and many are sitting here by the way. So they bring in a very global perspective with a lot of teaching backgrounds to our class. And what we do is we find partners in the world field of science, like CERN, or like the Medical University in Vienna, or like the Biobank in Graz. So we find a system that deals with science and with scientific questions, and we somehow invade them and connect to them, and they also invade us a little bit, and we learn from each other. And especially we take a look at the methods. How do they do their job? How do they? What is their way of thinking? What's their process? And it's very interesting that the scientists are also interested in the artists' processes. And in a, in, it's also interesting that, in a way, artists and scientists are detectives. They want to find out the truth somehow. And how you do that is actually not so different. Um, so we learn a lot from each other, and um, there's no rule. So that's the general answer. And every project is different. Every student brings a project, brings a question, and that somehow runs in the system of science and comes back to the system of art and goes back to the system of science. And depending on the question, you will find solutions, which are surprising. And I always tell students, if they know what will happen here, then it's not right. Because only if the unexpected happens in the study, if they produce works they would never have produced anywhere else, then actually we can call it a success. Uh, so, Mr. Bast, from the perspective of, of the director of the uh, University of, Applied, of an arts uh, of an arts university, which are the the, the cultural techniques uh, which you are most surprised by, uh, uh, which can give answers to all the questions we raised uh, in the last half half an hour, which are many. Well, <clears throat> we are we are facing a lot of. Uh, Things uh, in, in talks and discussions uh, by people from politics and by people from economics telling us, look, we are facing or at the beginning of the digital digital age, and therefore everybody has uh, to have uh, broad knowledge in the so-called uh, STEM disciplines: science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, and uh, everybody has to learn this uh, because of uh, this digital age and uh, uh, our society and economy will uh, be in this uh, stage. I think this is a big mistake. It's not about STEM. Uh, it's about much more. It's about uh, uh, social intelligence. It's about intuition. It's about uh, uh, the relevance of dealing with uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. It's about uh, being able to find uh, totally new combinations. So, I, I tell you a little story. Some, I think three years ago, it was in all papers, uh, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, supercomputer from, from IBM uh, won uh, the, comp uh, the, the game against uh, the Go monster. Uh, Go, you have to know this, is not just a simple game, it's the most complex and complicated game in the world, and it is one of the uh, five big uh, 
art topics uh, in Chinese history. The, the computer won, not once, uh, but uh, I think uh, in, in seven uh, uh, matches he won five of them. And everybody said in the computer, oh, uh, uh, the humans are on the loser uh, track against the machines. And then one of the Go, Go uh, players uh, analyzed uh, these games, and he, ca he came uh, to the uh, point that uh, the Go master began to lose the game against the machine as soon as he tried to think and to act in the mechanistic meaning of the machine. So the computer had, I think, uh, two million Go matches in his system, and he analyzed and uh, constructed uh, uh, all, all these things. But Go is, is, a, is an art form where intuition is very much uh, important. And I think this is an important thing for us. Uh, we, we've got to lose the game against the machine as soon as we try to act and to think uh, in the mechanisms and in the meanings of a machine. If we do that, we don't have a chance. And therefore we have to find those areas where we, at least, I know your argument, Sir Lincoln, at least now and maybe some 10, 15 years more, uh, where humans will be better than machines. Let's uh, talk again uh, for our children in 20 years. Uh, I think uh, now we have to, to uh, focus on those uh, qualifications uh, we need to, to survive in this situation. And it's kind of alarming for me and also significant that uh, people from the World Economic Forum and this is not uh, an association of uh, some esoteric uh, people. Uh, they say the most important qualification skills uh, for the people uh, in the economies of the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years are critical thinking, dealing with complexity and creativity. Creativity not meant uh, uh, making beautiful drawings and singing nice songs, but uh, just these things like uh, what is uh, ambiguity, what is contextualization, how to construct uh, abstraction and to deal with abstraction, uh, how to contextualize uh, seemingly different uh, areas. So these three things are the most important qualifications. There's nothing about uh, uh, coding, nothing about uh, uh, technology. Of course, we will need people uh, knowing that, but uh, the core competences for the whole society, for economy, and for our political uh, situation and the systems will be these three uh, qualifications. Yeah, but we are, I mean, we are talking about computers, about machines from the perception of 2019. So what about in 20 years or 30 years or even in 10 years when maybe computers are not, you know, it's not the linear thinking anymore, it's about even computers, they know, they, are, uh, they have intuition, they, they, they know uh, creativity, uh, you know, everything you mentioned, you mentioned before, so the, the, the picture would change dramatically, wouldn't it? It would change the picture, but uh, now we have to deal with the situation uh, within the next 15-20 uh, years. Uh, of course, there is a discussion uh, will be uh, machines in, in 20, 30 years having uh, self-awareness, uh, uh, having intuition. Uh, so far, uh, we even don't know what is our brain and how is our brain working. Uh, so we are some years, I would say, uh, away from constructing an artificial brain. So we have this uh, situation with artificial intelligence uh, and what we have to deal with is what are the consequences uh, 
of these uh, opportunities uh, of artificial intelligence, of genetic engineering, robotics, uh, as we will have it uh, now and in the next uh, 15 years. And uh, in this time, I think if we find ways to, to prepare people uh, to deal with this situation we have now, uh, we also have a chance to influence uh, and to shape the future where we are going to. We don't have a chance if we say we are fighting against technology, I'm totally with you. Uh, that's no option. And uh, we also don't have a chance if we say we are ignoring uh, the situation, hoping that we are able to dive through uh, what we always hear from uh, our politicians. So, Ruth, now you are not fighting uh, uh, machines and technology and the, uh, the world of uh, the digital world already for, say, 35 years. I think you started uh, in the mid 80s uh, to do digital uh, arts. How can art, how can culture help, help, help us dealing with, uh, with, with that? What, is, what are your experiences with that? First, I want to point out just to answer to the algorithm. Algorithm, and I find this very important. Probably the algorithm is a form, yeah? but the AI is fed with data, and the data is a massive amount of data, and the data, but these data are 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 prejudices or pre-justice, uh, bias, and stereotypes are embedded in this data. So what we are doing is the algorithm's search patterns are therefore a representation of reality. So this is a very, I find it a very important point that, that it's not neutral. Yeah? It's that is the data we have. And, and okay. Uh, in the of course, in the, in, the, in the digital art, as professor for digital art, but also I'm with this media since a long time, we, we, I say we, try, or for me it's, a, it's, a, it's also a mission to, to, to misuse, to, to look into it, to criticize it, to get as much information as possible, and to criticize it, and to transform this, to misuse, let's say, the machine, and then transform, and also to show a certain, uh, the certain, certain work out certain points of it, also as a critical artwork. Yeah? And, um, yeah, that, that's mainly it, and that's, this is also at the digital art department. This is a goal, and, and when I, I, I looked through the works, what, what they have done, for instance, and uh, for instance, I, I, I would like to show one work, uh, or not to show, but to, to mention one work, uh, which was one done in 2009, uh, with, from Gordon Savic, Savicic, a former student of us, presented a work called Web 2.0 Suicide Machine. And together with a group of artists, okay, and once uh, it is a program, then once you hand over your login details and click comment, uh, it will methodically delete your information. For example, on Twitter, tweet, Facebook, whatever, whatever, at that time existed in very early time. And the reaction was, not only an article in the Time magazine, the, the uh, 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 commercial, uh, the, 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 the newspapers, uh, especially English newspapers, uh, were alarmed about this. Yeah? Uh, the economic newspapers were alarmed about this. So they, they took something out in a very early time, ten years ago, and 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 could even even get the articles in the on economic newspapers. That's a, a that's an interesting work and it's an important work, yeah? To to 
point the finger in the in the wand. Yeah. So that's the role of of, of arts in the digital uh, in the digital age to point the finger in the in the wine uh, in, in the wounds to be like prophets or I mean what's what is the role of arts in, in these ages? Because I mean there are so many people out there uh, they wouldn't think about art dealing with all the, uh, with the revolution going out uh, 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 right now. Uh, why is art? Or, to question the, uh, to ask the question a different way. Why is art so so important right now? Or is it? Yeah, uh, because art can find other ways of transportation, also content. But in general, it's not probably there for my own artwork, and also I, I try to support critical artwork, but it's not the only goal which art, art has. Yeah? It, it is not uh, 20 years before we had, to, you cannot always say the art has to, to save the world. The art can participate in this if the artist wants to do that, yeah? but it's not obligatory because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was the feminism. Everybody had to do, to, to, to solve, to, to put the problems. And personally, I am in this, in this outfit to, to point this out, but in a, in a way which is not only illustrating, to fight its, its important system and what the art can is uh, to, to transfer it into a, a different way and find other solutions for it. Before I ask uh, Ms. Yaman, uh, can I ask you what did you mention? Sorry. The question is, which kind of art are we talking about? So, uh, are we talking about the, the art uh, which is existing and successful within uh, the existing art markets? Or are we talking about something different, uh, which uh, in my opinion will have much more importance and relevance uh, in the future than it has now? compared to the art market part. Um, of course, there will be art markets uh, in the future as well, and they will be important. Uh, but uh, if we uh, think about what we talked about uh, some minutes ago, what is happening to our societies, losing a lot of, uh, of uh, jobs, if we uh, look at what uh, is required to the new kind of jobs and the new kind of economies and the new kind of uh, participating in society and politics, we automatically come uh, to these uh, artistic uh, methodologies, which is not just relevant for uh, producing art in the art market. And art also has, a, I think it's, it's proved uh, uh, position uh, beyond the existing art markets in societies. Uh, I always would predict that uh, uh, we we are, although everybody is talking about the age of digital machines and technology, we are about to enter uh, the age of creativity uh, as a counterpart. Uh, being uh, in a situation that uh, these uh, so-called creative methods, creative skills, uh, becoming uh, as important or maybe even more important as uh, quantitative methods uh, were and still are in all kinds of uh, areas in, in our world. We all know about uh, what is happening to our universities, uh, quantification is a big topic, and in the uh, 19 70s, 1980s, we all realized that statistics and other quantitative methods took over large parts of academia, from economics to psychology. And uh, we all know what, what is happening and uh, which kind of effect we've had. Uh, I think uh, uh, we only have a chance to, to meet the challenges uh, the digital age uh, is uh, providing us if we uh, find answers uh, on the creative uh, level, on the level of uh, 
bringing the arts uh, in other parts uh, of uh, academia uh, and in other parts of our society. Uh, so, Ms. Yaman, as a, as a professor of artistic re, re, re research, can you tell us a little bit about the, the art forms uh, you, 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 you dive in, uh, you are especially looking at? Mm. Yeah, um, this helps me also to give some reactions to what we said before, because what we do with this artistic PhD in arts is that we have many different disciplines and the one um, common discourse groups, people from very different backgrounds, and that's also an answer to what the art can do in relation to these um, challenges of the digital age, the digital transformation of our communication structures, of our living worlds, of our perceived and conceived and lived worlds, because, exactly because art can be very flexible in its methods and use a lot of different fields. We can collaborate with the scientists and we can use and apply this method of a digital algorithm reflection and then also of the data that was mentioned in biology. We can appropriate methods and develop then an individual new method in order to generate our own insights, our own epistemic objects that we achieve with this artwork, like a research interest that we also have. And this one has then really also an impact on society because it really poses question before questions and generates answers that we don't know before. We don't prove anything, we don't give an evidence with this artwork, we generate certain objects and new questions that evolve out of it from the different fields. And this is something, I want to give something that Ruchner was mentioning, the data and the bias that is implemented then in the processes that are connecting, and I know that's your field, also building really these research projects, how this data is then classified in order to develop something which makes, them, makes it then possible to analyze the data on different layers which makes up this what is called now um, artificial intelligence and the deep learning um, network. It consists of many layers of data and how they are classified and this is so very different than as we classify. And that's what the artwork can do. What I have seen and did with artworks myself also it's completely easy for us to uh, analyze the, the image or face. It's very different for the, the neural network and it classifies completely different. It's about this difference and so we can connect to what we learn from all the discourses about difference, also in the gender discourses, for example. It reminds me of the early cyber-feminist discourse also some years ago, Documenta X. And there I come to an artwork which is shown here now from my dear friend Shuli Chang from Taiwan. She was active as an activist in the early net artwork and she has a big installation at uh, the Kolandarali, but right now where she analyzes in an installation, it's called 3x6, three, 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 X, three, X, I don't know, it's X, I don't know, it's X, but it also could be a code, so it's, it's the measurement of a cell, of the way of specification recognition, and how somebody fictionally is controlled in there, like a dystopian scenario, but in a narration, in a filmic narration, in an installation, but she was an activist in the cyber feminist movement, in the network, world since the 90s and communicates this now very differently. So that's what the artist can do. He really applying these big variety of different flexible methods, methodologies of research as well, in order to generate, not only to communicate, but in order to generate relevant questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. I just imagined uh, a guest uh, from like an arts university from like 20 or 30 years ago being among us, hearing us speak about all the different topics we, we, we mentioned. We mentioned. I think he or she would be quite surprised 
about uh, the topics, about the role of, your, of the university, about what art is or what art uh, can, can, can be. Which leads me to the third part of our, our discussion about the future of arts universities. Um, I don't know who would like to, to begin. I think uh, the arts universities, they are deeply rooted in a, in a system um, from the 19th century. But uh, arts changed so much uh, in the last, in the last uh, years, in the last 10, 20, 30 years. So how does the art, how does arts universities have to change um, as well? Um, I don't know, the Meta Bauer would like to begin. Very interesting conversation yesterday with a scientist from the Max Planck Institute, and that uh, feeds also to what I heard from colleagues again at MIT and now in my university. Um, to have this space uh, of freedom of thinking and freedom of experimentation, and I think it's um, where I see the future of the art institution is to open them up to other disciplines to share a certain methodology and to provide the space of. Um, different kind of thinking and interaction. Um, I think we, unfortunately, at universities, we are much more uh, restricted. We all have to apply for plans. Money is an important keyword. And everybody who has to write big grant applications know that we already almost need to know the result of our research in order to be a successful grant um, submission. And I think that really limits us enormously to deal with the real challenges of our times. So I really, what I always enjoy to be as an art um, program within a larger university entity, so to be a kind of like a refuge for other students, and they collaborate with other students on bigger challenges and throw the knowledges together. And I think I, I see the possibility of Gerhard Basta mentioned um, that that this this way how artists think or like this this kind of different um, open space, um, I think it's, it's very, very needed. And the question is like this, with jobs, we also have to think what kind of jobs do we have? And, and the fear of so many people who at this moment are um, maybe shifting more to the right, um, to, to vote very conservative, that they are in fear of losing their jobs. And we always have to tell them, but what job are you losing? You know, and, Maybe what is gained? I mean, we are also not good of explaining these massive changes to, to people. They're very afraid of those changes. And I think if we can make these changes more tangible to people, again, also art makes a lot of things much more tangible <laughs> and understandable to, to people who have this fear of technology, although we are completely embedded in it. And I see there is a potential um, for me of the art schools. And when you say 20 years ago we haven't saw that, I don't agree. I think that was pretty much, I mean, the market Yaman's laughing I mean, a bit. We were talking about all of this more than 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The convention is called PowerPoint. Okay, yeah. no, Let's so say 50 years ago, sorry. <laughs> no, but, no, but it, I think a lot is always there and comes and goes. I mean, that is why I mentioned I was looking back, or, and we had this post you with debate if you look back at 68. But, uh, no, if you look back, if you look back at the Kubrick, it is six, it was shot in '68. It was shot before the moon landing, and so I think we sometimes forget. I mean, like we always think everything is new. I think we go back and forth and cycles, which is great. And I, 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 it's also it's always like predicting the future. I come from a city where it's constantly about predicting the future. Singapore is about predicting the future, and I was like, why don't you deal with the now? which they have huge difficulties. But let me ask it maybe the question in a different way. Is the transformation process we are in right now, is that fast enough concerning universities, arts universities? Because for sure, I mean, so many things changed, but were they enough? I think at this point, I'm, I'm very concerned about access to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think this was a huge achievement, for example, that uh, we can have free education universities are accessible to as many people as possible um, without legitimizing will they all get a job afterwards because I think if you had a good university education you might invent your job does it even exist then so I think this this notion of being like um, in a space what you said of, of creative thinking of connecting dots you know like making predictable um, 
connections. I think this is for me still the future, but it was, that was almost there, I mean, like, is that 500 years of Leonardo da Vinci? So, so, so I don't think we are at a new place, but I think maybe what I see now is, is very, very crucial is to really understand that we are just, our species is just one part of species and we are no more, we always think we are the dominant one, but I think that is slowly fading and I think that's a very good development. I mean, you were mentioning Leonardo da Vinci. He was one. He was a universal gelehrter. He was a, a, a universal thinker. I don't know the English, the, the, the English word, but the history. An outside. An outside, right? Uh, but the history, the history of, of the universities uh, is, is the history of, of fragmentation. Uh, so, uh, which leads us to, to to my next question. I mean, do we have to to rethink the role of the university of this? Of this process of the of the of the of different departments of the curriculum, uh, totally, uh, Mr. Bast. Yes, we we urgently have to rethink uh, the system of the university, and not only the system of art school, but even more the system of uh, big uh, science uh, and humanities schools and economic uh, and business administration schools. Uh, this does not mean that we have to abandon all this disciplinary research and, and teaching. We, we will need them. But if we talk about uh, mass higher education, and uh, in this uh, sense I'm as uh, conservative as, as you are, I think we need uh, a massive uh, boost of higher education in the next uh, decades uh, uh, due to these changes we have. Uh, yeah, so. Not just uh, as the European Union says, we need 35% uh, of uh, people with higher education among the population. I think uh, we need uh, up to 80% uh, of people with some form of higher education in, in the next future. But this will be a totally different form of higher education. And this will lead to this uh, kind of uh, uh, universal education. Uh, the education which is able to to combine knowledge uh, to, to uh, make uh, uh, happen that you are able to to translate different uh, areas and uh, what we talked about uh, these uh, typical uh, skills uh, or methods uh, artists are working with uh, these are methods uh, we even more need uh, in large parts of uh, our societies and our professions. So what we now have as a situation for the art schools, 5% uh, or I don't know, maybe 7 or 8 or 3 uh, of uh, uh, the, the people graduating from, from fine arts are able to live from uh, their uh, artwork uh, as gallery. Two percent. Okay. But uh, but if we, we ask our students, uh, and we have uh, uh, every every few years, uh, uh, we are asking our graduates what what are they doing. We see that uh, they are working in totally different, very different areas, uh, and they can profit from what they learned uh, at our university. What we have to do is we have to stop to accept that what they have gained is kind of a collateral benefit. This is not a collateral benefit. This is a very important benefit or uh, education they get for their life, for the future of their life. This is what we have to point out in the future much more than, than we will do. <coughs> And therefore, what we provide, what we offer as forms of education at uh, universities of the arts and uh, other universities will be, have, will be uh, different in this meaning that uh, this uh, merge of disciplines, uh, combining uh, artistic methods uh, with uh, principles of uh, science, technology, and economics, looking at what is happening in the world uh, at grand uh, challenges, uh, frontiers. 
this is the future uh, of, of academia. And if we in the existing university don't do this, uh, uh, the big uh, data company will do this. So we all know that Apple and Amazon uh, are looking at education as the most profitable business field in the next 20, uh, 25 years. So the question now is, uh, will education be defined by uh, yes, uh, shareholder value interest or will it be defined by the interest of uh, democratic uh, policies? But isn't that a very optimistic view? I mean, uh, you are <laughs> Uh, I mean, the thing is, uh, two, I mean, you mentioned 2%, 3.5%, 5, 5, 5%, uh, which is a very poor, poor number. How can we bring the, 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 the society to, to acknowledge that, to, uh, to, to, to uh, have your view on, on that this is not a collateral damage, but these are real advantages? Uh, students uh, coming out from uh, from your universities, from arts universities, uh, have uh, you know what I mean? It's uh, you know the, the the perspective from the arts university maybe is a very different one from the society. Yes. I just want to comment this, and I have to go to this. It's, if we think like um, an artistic education should lead to a certain uh, kind of like feel like. Um, art school, gallery, museum, if we think that then it's 2%, if we think they should survive in that, it's also I mean, in an artistic um, possible <coughs> way, get a gallery or getting a commission, then it's very limited, but there is so many more um, areas where the way of thinking that, that this, uh, what, what we basically also gain individually in this context, it allows us so much more, and I think it's much more to get away from this thinking. If you study this, this is what you become. I mean, a philosopher, a profession, do it as a philosopher. So I think we have to get away from thinking um, to be an artist is a job, and, and because then we come to these percentages. And to me, the, the potential, the importance is self determination. That that we really are able to. Why we have these huge fears in societies, and why is we also, this um, techno phobia, in a way, um, is also coming from that, that the people they cannot be self determined. They have learned that to, to be self determined and to lose this fear of um, you have to manage your life yourself. And you will have to. This, this, this are pathways that we have in the past. You want a company, a state of your life, you have a family, you stay at one place. This is changing. And how do we prepare ourselves? But this new environments, and uh, we are much, we are very different. I mean, that has changed. Under our schools, our life has changed. And how do we deal with this? And how do we basically prepare next generation to deal with this? That is one of my questions. But at the same time, I guess uh, art school has to change as well. So how do we have? To uh, how do we have to rethink our curricula at, at art school? Um, in the I don't know if you also opened the panel because I have seen that there was some will to comment on certain elements, maybe not just on this question, but uh, maybe on this. I, I start with some something else. We will say the curricular. Maybe you didn't call it like that, but you said you have detectives in your uh, in your program. Great, <laughs> and I think I would like like that we see a lot of agents. <laughs> also great in the program that uh, we have and uh, because agents of change because also at the other affiliation that you mentioned which is the Zurich University of the Arts we have collaborations with the ETH, with the technical universities in my field at least with the game design department there and where we also exchange as agents of change certain methods, the technological programming um, methods are exchanged with the artistic interventions. This goes into the curricula, these courses, labs are established. So here, I think we, 
we change and react a lot. It's a constant flux also of the development. Rector Bast was mentioning this morning already uh, at another discourse that we had before uh, some of these uh, points that are quite important of this fluctuation and also that it's not about universal gelehrte, also also um, Leonardo was not a universal gelehrte, he was a, maybe a universal thinker, but he was not universally educated. He was very, his education was, the family was saving money on him because he was a queer, illegitimate child who got the cheapest education, which was art. <laughs> to put it into very floppy, floppy ways. <laughs> which led to exactly, it's not a collateral education, it's a central education. Maybe this remains since hundreds of years already, one constant, but it needs to be integrated in the different fields, in the different fields of uh, understanding. But maybe I hand over to the yeah. Just to one sentence, I think, we, okay. we have to have in mind that what we now understand as curriculum won't exist anymore in 15, 20 years, so we will have much more personalized uh, education even at universities. We will have uh, a massive change into project orientation rather than uh, gaining information. We will have uh, a situation where we are dealing with the combination of knowledge rather than to store knowledge. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have uh, tracks leading to a certain profession, may it be a producing artist or a, a chemist, and we will have a totally different kind of education. This leads us again to what will be uh, the future term of work, of human work. Education including uh, the, the parts of, uh, uh, of uh, artistic methods to create will be part of the new definition of work. So before we open the discussion to the public, it's quarter past two now. Uh, a last comment from Vinny Vinny. Well, I think we have to acknowledge that art has lost its impact on society. A hundred years ago, Jules Verne invented the journey to the moon, even more than a hundred years ago, and science, many years later, made it possible. So the dream was for the artists, and then came science to make it possible. Now it's the other way around. The dreamers are the scientists, and art is going after that. So we are second, and we've lost the impact. The art market is divided into a very small, for very rich people, market of high value priced artworks. And this thing here has to do a lot with that. Um, but it has no impact. These are 5,000 people who are rich. And on the other hand, we have all the rest who are seen by, who have no audience. We make movies that nobody sees, we make paintings that nobody sees, or just a few people. So the impact on society, to transform society, is quite limited. And we can also see that companies, political parties, and even terrorists use artistic methods. You know, methods of intervention and methods of communication. So I think it's very logical what Gerhard Bast is trying to do with uh, Angemante, that we try to extend our 2% impact to a higher level, to use art education and methods used in art, learned in art, and a holistic worldview to put people in other positions, in one of power and in one that can transform society as well. And otherwise we will leave it all to the neoliberals who just want to make money. And that would be very dangerous. I hope not to the terrorists. Um, so I would like to... Okay, I would like to open the, the discussion to the panel, to the, to the audience. Uh, please. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. And my mind is, is swirling with all sorts of thoughts. So, Maybe I'll give you my mic. So I may not uh, articulate all those thoughts as clearly as, clearly as I'd like to, but I'll try. So first of all, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence as a big threat. We have missed some of the other big threats. The climate change threat is, is far bigger than artificial intelligence. We talk talked about nature. Um, we talk about transforming society and the lack of impact. But we talk a lot about thinking. We didn't talk much about feeling. Whereas the real impact of art is the way that people think. 
and how do we want to change the way people think to transform society, potentially trans transform our, uh, into our society's consciousness. You know, that's what's required. We talk about the threat of AI damaging jobs, but the reality is that if we carry on with the same jobs we've got today, the outcome of that is a disruption of our society. So it's a good thing to change the jobs. It's not a bad thing. And the fact that we don't know what those jobs are, it obviously needs to work it out. But if we were to think that, in fact, those jobs must be jobs that are going to lead us to a better place and solve some of the really big problems, and how can art do that? Um, I've been a, I'm a technology guy, um, and I work uh, for a large accounting firm. We're in the process of change, and our change is all about recognizing our customers are changing, and their, their needs are changing. We're using technology to change the way we deliver for our customers, and I suggest that artists need to think about how they may change for the changing needs of their customers, and how they feel, and how they want their customers to feel. So, the, so my hypothesis is simply, um, let's use art to change feelings and understand what those feelings are that, that need to change to be able to improve our society. I mean, there was no question, but is there someone who would like to respond or to answer? So then we go to the next question. Uh, for kind of identity and not an identity which is 
uh, dividing people, but rather an identity, uh, what uh, Francis Fukuyama uh, just wrote, uh, uh, kind of a, a universal human identity. This is what art can give us if we are going in this direction, if we uh, are aware about uh, these needs uh, also at the, on the educational level. Regarding the Gene Roddenberry part, I think if you consider the ancient Greek as a model of that, spending time thinking, writing incredible dramas and inventing everything, um, they could do it because they had slaves. So maybe the slave, the role of the slaves could be done by the machines and the rest of us could spend the time writing dramas and thinking and dreaming. It would be very possible if people are intelligent enough for that, it's another question because there will always be some who want to dominate the others and want to make more money, etc., to bring this balance uh, out of balance again. But it would be a, an interesting vision. I, I think it's good to come back also to, to your question. To me, it's really like, not so much like, uh, where will the art go, or like, where will the other question is really, as I say, like, will we have enough food? What is the air quality? What is happening to the oceans? And if we, like, I mean, I live closer to the Pacific, the oceans are pretty empty already, or what is not empty is microplastic. So I think we, we are facing a pretty much bigger threats in the future of our education. And to me, or even jobs, just like at and, and this, is much more like, um, are we prepared like, for a massive climate migration? And, and we see it already, the, 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 many of the wars we're facing now started with um, climate migration and how do we deal with this and you brought up sens the sensibility here so we, we're living in a moment of a lot of fear and I think the question is how can we contribute and, and how can we do something to bring a different kind of tangibility to this and I think art has here a lot to offer not, not as something to sell but a real tangibility of those challenges because became so abstract for so many people what's going on. I mean, you deal with virtual realities, with AI, and for many people this is something they don't get, they don't understand this. And, and so we have, as I said, there is a big technophobia, but on the other side, we're really facing massive problems and changes that are coming to us. And how do we deal with these tensions in societies? So that is for me a much bigger question and also um, a big challenge that I feel. Because uh, 
also your statement that you read before that was showing us that it's real and also the term human condition that you use right now. That really helps me to link again also the argument that we had before because if we think about a viral network or artificial viral network, it is about the human condition and the human condition in a social exchange in a social exchange also with, uh, uh, you say, consciousness somehow, or so also global consciousness as well. I don't want to call it Gaia now, because then I sound too old school. <laughs> but uh, in, in relation about understanding, this is the surprising link that we have, that these uh, approaches of the digital technologies, of the digital tools, they help us to understand the human condition and how it affects and infects, affects, and then we are close, the affect becomes before the emotion in terms of an affect. Also, also the living condition of the world and that we are really facing challenging moments. That's absolutely true, but it's surprisingly a way to deal with it, to deal with the human condition. This might be one topic of the art and artistic research, by the way. So we are running out of time, but there are two questions left in, in the audience. Uh, first one is the lady here. Please. So this is a response to your question, but somehow try to synthesize the points that were brought up in the panel. So I think to have more, uh, more, more of an artist rather than more of a scientist, the answer would be more artists in labs or more artists in uh, or the, where the places and spaces where science or science is produced. And that was the case for the 90s, for BioArt, we had artists in residence program. And this leads us to this notion again of participation, more participation for artists and art. So again, uh, what is art and how can we conceive uh, of art today, not in the romantic 19th century sense, as something that artists do somewhere isolated, but um, something that somehow engages with the social, engages with science as a social construct, and something that gives opportunities for participation. And to overcome this, so to have more of the artists participating, we need uh, a kind of stronger institutional understanding of art as a form of production. So there is no, no we don't have, we can't have more participation if we don't think about art in institutional terms and in ways of putting more artists in institutional spaces where science is produced. And that's a participation issue. Thank you. So one last question. Yes, uh, or also a comment to the colleague before uh, talking about uh, what the artists should do and the relation to the sciences. Uh, for me, I always think about this uh, idea of the question of understanding. So there we also touch the moment of feelings. So if, we, if, if, if it's an adequate contribution to the, uh, to the transformation of understanding provided by the arts, and also then in a second step also to understand transformation differently, this is an added moment that could be quite interesting here to follow that thread of all this correlation between those other two. Thank you so much to all of you. Do you have a last question? <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, it's just a okay. last thought. Um, yeah. The art market, right back to the wealthiest people, that have sort of suggested that maybe that's not enough, we need to get out there. 5,000 wealthiest people on this planet, they can actually make the difference. You can change the way they think, mm -hmm. the investors, the bankers, and where they put their money, then you can change the world. They're the ones that can do it. Take a risk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Distribute them even. No, they can put the money into the right places, take it out. Well, well, that's <laughs> <we> <laughs> but let's hope that this is going that this is going to, to, to work. Thank you so much to all of you for this vivid, uh, super interesting uh, this discussion. Uh, thank you to the panel, thank you to the audience. Uh, there's one last thing I forgot uh, at the beginning. There uh, was, there is a live stream of the discussion on the website of the University of Applied Arts of uh, Vienna. I can, I'm sure you can uh, re uh, see the whole uh, discussion 
And yeah, I would like to close the discussion. Uh, I think all of the participants are uh, open to uh, question, to, uh, to other questions, one-to-one -one questions. Uh, thank you so much and have a lovely afternoon.